Okay. Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Sarah Neustad from Brookfield, Wisconsin. I'm a rising sophomore studying biology and statistics at the UW-Madison College of Letters and Sciences. And today it's my pleasure to introduce conservation biologist and Arboretum Director Karen Oberhauser, ecologist Brad Herrick, and native plant gardener Susan Carpenter, who will follow different paths to fandom, but all agree insects are really cool. Insects can illuminate the interconnectedness of natural communities, highlight conservation needs, and inspire humans to understand and protect them. Our speakers share their enthusiasm and knowledge about the beauty, diversity, value, and vulnerability of these charismatic creatures as part of their work at the Arboretum, in talks around the state and beyond, and through citizen science programs. We hope you enjoy this talk on Insects, rock stars of the Garden. Hi, thank you. This is Susan Carpenter, um, and I'm going to start out with one of the rock stars of the, of the garden and of the Arboretum, which are the native bees. And I want to talk about how to support native bees. So we're going to look at first the bee diversity in Wisconsin. We, have, we are interested in bees because they're very effective pollinators. They travel, uh, the adults travel around collecting nectar, which is a great carbohydrate, high energy uh, resource for them to um, nourish the adults. They also purposely collect pollen from flowers, the females do, to nourish the young. That's a protein rich food source. So they're traveling around and they're very effective pollinators, probably more effective than any of the other pollinators that you may have heard of. Um, of you, know, you might, may be surprised to see that Wisconsin has more than 400 kinds of native bees. And some of these are very tiny, maybe only a few millimeters long. You might never see them. And some of them are big, like a, a large bumblebee, maybe four centimeters long. So uh, our diversity represents a lot of different life cycles, different habitats, and different um, flowers that are visited different areas that are lived in in the state. And 85% of our native bees are solitary bee species. So most of them are solitary. And then 15% are the social or semi-social bees that have colonies. And we can see in the corner there of this, uh, of this diagram that we have 20 species of bumblebees. And since bumblebees are large and they're easier to learn and easier to recognize. I will share with you a lot of bumblebee information today. Uh, one thing to point out is that we do have a non-native type of bee that people do know about and think about, and that is the European honeybee. So obviously it's not a native bee in Wisconsin. It is a social bee, of course, maintained in hives, and it has a perennial colony. So from year to year, those colonies will last and survive. But all the bees that I've spoken about so far in the native bees are generally annual colonies. And that's important to remember when you're thinking about conservation. So here are some examples of the native solitary bees that we um, have in, that you could commonly find. And some of these you would see out and about right at this time of year. The ones on the left are bees that you'd see over a longer part of the season. They might visit several different kinds of flowers, uh, they have very interesting life um, histories. So this one here at the top, the megachile, is a leaf cutter bee. And she will gather little sections of leaves and bring them to a hollow, uh, a hollow, a, like a hollow place in a log or a crevice in a rock, something like that. And she will lay her eggs within that crevice or cavity and provision them with pollen that she's collected so that they can um, go through their life cycle. And she uses little segments of leaves to um, line that little chamber where the egg will be developing into an adult bee over the period of a year. The ones on the right-hand side are bees that are much more specialized. They're limited in the time that they're out. This little black one here, Dephoria monardi, is on bee balm and the pollen is white. You can see she's collected it. 
And that bee is only out during the time that the bee balm is blooming. So their whole life cycle takes place within those weeks in the middle of the summer. And the one at the lower, um, in the lower uh, left, lower right there is a cellophane bee. And the cellophane bee, this one is a ground nesting bee. So it has a little, there's a little hole in the, in the soil and the bee goes down and there's a branched area underneath the ground uh, with chambers, individual chambers, and she's gathering pollen from the willow here early, early in the spring and provisioning each of her eggs with a ball of uh, pollen from that plant. So, so these are, represent some of the different life cycles and uh, timing that you would see. The colonial species, I'll use bumblebees as the example here, and their life cycle is an annual life cycle. So the queen, the mated queen from the year before spends the winter in her hi in hibernation underground, and she um, emerges in the spring, and this part of the life cycle is the building part of the life cycle. So she will raise the colony, begin to lay eggs and raise the young, and the workers then will forage. And at this time of year, we're switching from that building time of the colony to the reproductive part of the life cycle. So the new queens for next year are um, hatched and the males, and then they mate, and the new uh, queen for next year will go into hibernation late in the summer or early in the fall. So this, these queens are the only connection between this year and next year. And this is important to remember because we do need to have areas where the queens can set up their hibernation chambers and we need areas where the nesting uh, can happen. So how can we help native bees? This is probably one of the most common questions that I hear from folks. And so the main, there are two things I mainly want to emphasize. One is to create and manage healthy habitats. We'll need the food resources, which are the flowers and plants that, uh, they, are, that they will be dependent on. We need those nesting and overwintering sites that I, des that I described um, just, just a moment ago. And we need pesti pesticide-free habitats if at all possible. And this is very important because pesticides can impact the colony's growth, the colony's survival, the number of queens that are produced for the following year, and uh, just the bees in general. So um, we also want to, in, in order to help native bees, we also want to monitor the bee species. So we want to know who's there. And that we do through photography, which is super fun, and citizen science projects, which allow us to share and uh, look for patterns in the information that everyone is finding all around the state. So if there's nothing else that you take away today, I would like you to remember Bumblebee Brigade. This is our project, citizen science project in Wisconsin. You can visit their website, lots of material online for you to participate right away. And there's bumblebees out and about, so you can get out your camera, your phone, and get started on documenting bumblebees in your area. If you're um, if you're badgering out in other states in North or in North America anywhere, you can use Bumblebee Watch. There's a similar project that covers those other areas. But if you're in Wisconsin, Bumblebee Brigade is the place to go. So what is involved in creating and managing healthy habitats? Well, here we want to think about native plants because native plants are the plants that native insects have evolved with for thousands of years. They have special relationships, general relationships, specific relationships, but those are the plants that are the most, um, that, that are the most important for the native insects. We want diverse uh, plants. We don't just want a couple kinds. Uh, we want plants that will, um, will be blooming throughout the season. We want lots of them. So we want to fill all the spaces with those plants. And then we want late season flowers and also early season flowers, but always species blooming throughout the season so that there's never a time when bees can't find their food and their, um, and the, the, their food for themselves and their pollen for their young. So this is what the garden looks like at the Arboretum right about now. We have the blazing stars, it's purple one blooming, the white mountain mint, the white culver's root, and then there's some yellow uh, sweet black-eyed Susans getting started there. 
And then this is a patch of Monarda bee balm back there in the background. We do want the suitable nesting and overwintering sites. And this is where you can get into your uh, little bit lazy gardening. You wanna leave some leaf compost and leave some rock piles and have a little, have edges and bare soil and some um, places where the bees could, where the bumblebees, for example, could dig down. You wanna have sticks and uh, hollowed out branch, uh, branches and stalks where uh, the littler bees can lay their eggs in, a, in those cavities. And then, of course, again, um, no insecticides, especially the systemic insecticides, which are the ones that um, get into the tissue of the plant to protect the plant, but they also are in the pollen nectar and they will kill insects that are, um, that are using those plants. The next uh, stage of helping with um, bee conservation and pollinator conservation is monitoring. So this is a, one of the training classes of, from a couple years ago. Um, you get to go out knee high in native plants and find bees and start to learn about them. Photography is our main method. There's lots of resources and those are available at Bumblebee Brigade for starters. Photography, you can get right up close to the bees and um, you, you record several pictures of each bee so that you can see all the characteristics and the plant that they're visiting. And we can learn uh, different things from this, not just who's there and which plants they're using, but we can learn about behavior. Here's a rusty patch bumblebee nectar robbing on the bee balm. This is a rusty patch uh, queen, a future queen in the fall. She's nectaring a little bit before she uh, goes into her hibernation um, chamber. And then we are also looking at how different species of bees use the floral resources. Which bees use which flowers? Um, which, are they all, are all the bees similar or do they have differences in how they use the um, environment? And this is just what you, you eventually come up with uh, after a time, you come up with a list of the bees on your site. This is actually a kind of Madison area list, but uh, here we have an, quite almost all the species you could possibly expect to see in southern Wisconsin. And the ones with stars are the ones that are uh, endangered or declining or of species of greatest conservation need. So that you will find some of them as well. And just a huge variety of their color patterns and uh, forms. And then this is the rusty patch bumblebee, which you may have heard of. This is a um, a bee that was quite rare, been lost over most of its range. And we found it, we, it was found at the Arboretum almost 10 years ago now. And so we're, uh, we've been looking at it, monitoring it for quite some time. The pattern you're looking for with rusty patch is to see two yellow bands on the abdomen. And the second band has a rusty patch toward the front of the bee with a yellow, with still yellow showing toward the back of the bee on that segment. So this is, um, these are all pictures of the same kind of bee, um, the, the rusty patch bumblebee. Three years ago, it was declared a, um, it was designated as an endangered species at the federal level. So that's caused quite a bit of interest and quite a bit more uh, monitoring for it, which is really great. And this is the pattern when I said uh, monitoring, you don't just take the pictures and keep them in your camera, uh, you want to share them. And so these are, uh, this is a map showing the locations, the red marks show the locations of um, Rusty Patch Bumblebee. This is a 10 year sighting and there's still a few updates that would need to be added to this one from very recent sightings. But this includes a lot of citizen science. So if you were in uh, Wisconsin, many of these uh, records here are from Bumblebee Brigade, which is only in its third year of data collection. And you can see that the area that we see rusty patch primarily is in this is in the uh, Midwest through these few Midwestern states. The grayed out area on the map that extends into Canada all the way to the East Coast and uh, down to the mountains of Georgia was the original range of rusty patch. And now it turns out that this smaller area that you see now is really primarily where it's still found. Um, so any information that you have about this bee 
can be shared uh, with Bumblebee Brigade. It will go directly to the Fish and Wildlife Service, who's in charge of um, putting together plans for the recovery and uh, eventually, hopefully, delisting of the endangered species. So garden, learn, and share what you find. Any questions? Hey Susan, we're we're right at our time here. So we did have one question come in, but maybe we can hold it till the end. Okay. All right. Um, I'm Karen Oberhauser. I'm the director of the Arboretum, and I'm going to talk about one species of insect where Susan mentioned that there are 400 to 500 species of bees in Wisconsin. She focused on bumblebees. We have 132 different kinds of butterflies in Wisconsin, but I'm just going to talk about one of them, and that's the monarch butterfly. But we call this um, presentation insect rock stars of the Arboretum, but monarchs are not only rock stars, but they're also royalty. And they were named after King William of Orange, who was the King of England when people from England first started coming to the New World and the late 1600s and, and when people from, from Europe came and in the late 1600s and 1700s and they saw this beautiful butterfly that they named after their king, who was King William of Orange. Um, so that's, that's the species we'll be talking about here. And I just wanted to point out to you that I'm going to be focusing on citizen science. So I've listed the names of the people who are collecting data about monarchs at the Arboretum. Um, you can see the people who are collecting data in the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project and Journey North. And I just wanna remind you, you can ask us questions on chat. And I'm going to be, it's gonna be a little awkward here because I'm gonna to have to be telling Susan to change the slides, she's in charge here. So when you hear us say next, we're asking Susan to change the slides. So just a quick reminder about um, monarchs. They have four stages to their life cycle, and we're gonna start in the upper left here with the egg. They're an egg for four to five days. The egg hatches and becomes a caterpillar. It's a caterpillar for nine to 13 days, and then it becomes a pupa or a chrysalis. Um, here you can see the picture of the chrysalis. It's that for eight to 12 days. And then it becomes an adult butterfly and the adult butterfly lives different lengths of time depending on if it migrates or not. So I say here that it's two to six weeks and that's if it's a summertime adult. If you're seeing monarch butterflies in your yard right now, they'll live two to six weeks. And the ones that migrate to Mexico in the fall will live eight to 10 months. And you'll start seeing those migratory butterflies in about the middle of August. All right, the next slide. Um, Susan, can we switch the slides here? The slide to the next one? Okay, so we're focusing on what Susan talked about, what, what insects need in, in gardens. Um, monarchs need basically the same things that bees do. They need lots of flowers, but the caterpillars only eat milkweed. And I just want to point out that I'll be using the word larva and caterpillar interchangeably. It's, it's, you can say either one of those. But we have over 100 milkweed species that are native to North America, 12 that are found in Wisconsin, and we have seven that I've circled here that are found in the Arboretum. So you can see the ones that are found in Wisconsin are um, all the pictures here, and then the circled ones are present in the Arboretum. So seven different species of milkweed. Monarch adults eat nectar from many different species of flowering plants. So when you plant flowers for bees, they'll be good for butterflies as well. We have hundreds of species of nectar sources at the Arboretum. And here you can see monarchs on many of these. And I just want to point out on this slide, you'll see one species that's not native. And I'm not going to say which one it is just for a couple seconds. So look at these pictures and see if you can pick out the non-native plant species. And if you picked this one, the lilac, which is in the, the second from the left on the top, 
That is not a native species, but it's a really important nectar source for bees and butterflies in the spring when there's a not, not a lot of other things blooming. So that's the one non-native plant in that slide. So we have lots of monarch citizen science programs and together these citizen science programs provide a portrait of monarch biology. So Susan talked about some ways that you can study bees. There are also lots of ways that you can study monarchs. And here you can see from the people in this slide that it's a really fun thing to do as well, to go out into, into a field and look for monarch eggs and caterpillars. So because of these citizen science, we know a lot more about monarchs and we also know better how to conserve them. So that's been really important in our understanding of monarchs and saving them. And the next slide gives a list. There are many citizen science projects. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but there are five big ones that have been going on for a long time and that are large scale. And you can look at this slide and, and Probably a lot of you have done some of these projects. Um, there's the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, which started in 1996, and it's now jointly coordinated at the Arboretum and by the Monarch Joint Venture. Journey North, which began a couple years before that, is coordinated at the Arboretum. And then the North American Butterfly Association is a group that started doing counts in 1975. And the Arboretum has been the starting point for the Madison count for 30 years. And then a couple of other projects listed here that people participate in at the Arboretum, um, Monarch Health, which collects data on monarch parasites, and then Monarch Watch, which is a tagging program. So lots of ways you can contribute to our understanding of monarchs. And the next slide, gives a little information about the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, detail here about this project, but I just wanna tell you that if you go out and see a monarch or even just see milkweed until, let's see the date here, until August 2nd, you can report any monarchs that you see, adult monarchs, caterpillars, eggs, milkweed, to the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. And you just need to do this by August 10th. This is part of a, a continent-wide monitoring blitz. So we have people from Canada, the United States, and Mexico taking part in that. So um, feel free to, to search out the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project on the web and contribute your sightings of monarchs. The next slide shows a little bit of data that we're collecting. So a um, few graphs here, hold, hold on. And this shows you how many monarchs we're seeing right now at the Arboretum. And this is the people that have been collecting the data that I showed you on the first slide. So this graph, the different colors on the graph are the proportions of milkweed plants that have monarchs of different stages on them. And the picture under here shows five different caterpillars. There's a little tiny one um, going up to a big one. The different colors are are the different stages of caterpillars and the blue part of the bars are the eggs. There's a little tiny egg right up here in the top of that slide. So you can see that we had pretty low numbers at the beginning of the season and then a big jump up when we have the new generation of monarchs starting at the Arboretum. So if you click again, we can compare by having these data for many years and we've been doing this at the Arboretum for three years now and here we have data from 2020, which is the one on the top that you've already seen, and then 2019 and 2018. And if you notice, there are different y-axis scales. And the scale for 2019 goes a lot higher. We saw more monarchs in 2019, so the numbers are lower this year. That's the bad news. The good news is we had a really nice July uptick in numbers. So we'll see what goes on for the rest of the season at the Arboretum and throughout Wisconsin and throughout the country with people monitoring. And then the next slide, I'll just give briefly a couple slides about Journey North. Like I said, Journey North is run at the UW-Madison Arboretum. And this is a program where people can just track any monarch that they see. And we're particularly interested in the movement of monarchs as they move north in the spring. Journey North doesn't just cover monarchs, it does other species, but today I'll be talking about the monarch data. So this tracks migrations and the season. And the next slide 
you can see what happens. So each one of the dots on this map is a person seeing their first monarch of the, of the year. So you can see the lighter yellow colors, the monarchs first come into the United States from Mexico and kind of cover the southeastern quarter of the United States. And then as the colors get darker red, those are the monarchs moving further north. And all of these dots that have a, a white circle in the middle of them have a picture associated with them. So here's somebody who took a picture, somebody named Beth, who took a picture of a monarch, the first monarch that she saw of the year. So this is a really wonderful way to track monarchs as they're moving north, something students can do, um, anyone who's interested in monarchs. So the next slide kind of summarizes why people are insect citizen science, scientists. When you're an insect citizen scientist, you're contributing to our understanding of insects. We would never know so much about monarchs or many other species if we didn't have people collecting data. With this information, we can preserve insects. So this is another thing that motivates people. People learn a lot about the insects as they're doing the projects. And they also make connections with people who have similar interests that they do. So the next slide, I think is my question slide, and I think I have a couple minutes left here for questions, so happy to answer them. And then while I'm answering questions, um, feel free to contact me. Here's my, my email address and the web addresses for the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project in Journey North. Okay, Karen, we have some really great questions. Um, so here's a question from Katrina. We see monarchs in our garden, even watch them laying eggs on our milkweed but never a caterpillar. Are other insects eating the eggs? Can we do anything to help protect the eggs? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And there are a lot of things out there that eat monarch eggs. In fact, the survival of an egg from one day to the next is actually pretty low. We can measure that. It's about 20% of them that survive from one day to the next. So there is a lot of mortality there are a lot of other insects and spiders and things that eat the eggs so, and the young caterpillars. Um, the best way to help monarchs is to create habitat for them. But if you want to bring some into your home and rear some of them, that's great too. I actually am raising a couple on my kitchen table right now. So you can bring them in and there are directions on the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, the MLMP website, that show you how to do that safely. So you really need to bring them inside if you want to protect them. But it's also, you know, it's just a natural part of nature. Monarch females lay um, about 500 eggs in their lifetime. So even if only 2 to 5% of them survive, that's enough to regenerate the population. Okay. We have another question from Venkata who asks, uh, she's an incoming freshman for fall 2020 and would like to volunteer at the UW Arboretum to help restore ecosystems and support insect populations. What kinds of qualities does she need to do so? Well, that's really great and welcome. Welcome to the UW. Um, it'll be great. We'd love to see you out at the Arboretum. And really the most important thing, the most important quality is curiosity. Just being willing to look and learn and um, kind of just keep your thinking cap on and, and and ask a lot of questions and, and be open to learning a lot. So we'd love to involve you in activities. Um, there are citizen science opportunities. We have jobs at the Arboretum um, when we open up again. So yeah, just come out and introduce yourselves to us. Great. And one more from Michael. Um, he lives in a rural area and has amazing native field flowers this year and lots of Monarda. He'd like to put up an educational roadside sign to help educate neighbors on pollinator-friendly practices. Does UW have anything like that available? So we don't have a specific UW sign that you can use to delineate habitat, but there are a lot of pollinator-friendly signs or even monarch signs that you can that you can purchase and put on a site to inform people, or you can just make your own sign. But there are signs, um, the National Wildlife Federation has a pollinator-friendly sign that you could get. Um, the Xerces Society 
That's spelled X E R C as in as in California, um, ES, Xerces Society has signs that are available for pollinator friendly habitat. You can get a sign from the Monarch Watch program. Um, monarchwatch.org has signs. So lots of places you can get signs or just make your own. And that's a great idea because it really does educate people about what's going on in your habitat. Okay, we're at our time now. So we'll go ahead to the next slide. All right, that's my cue. Uh, hard act to follow, uh, Susan and Karen. Um, and I, uh, I couldn't think of a catchy title, so I thought I'd just say Dragon's Life with an exclamation mark. So hopefully my enthusiasm comes through here virtually. Um, and like Karen and Susan mentioned, feel free to um, uh, Facebook or chat questions in as they come up and if there's time, um, I'll answer them after the talk. So we can go forward, slide Susan, thank you. Um, so I thought m most people that maybe aren't familiar with Dragonfly might be asking some basic questions from the beginning. And that is, what's interesting about dragonflies? Um, and you know, why should I care about them? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to answer those right off the bat here for you. So the biggest, the biggest reason in terms of why, why you should care about them or why, why they're in, important to, to ecosystem health um, is that they represent this um, indicator of a healthy environment, um, especially a healthy aquatic environment. So dragonflies, uh, and I'll talk about their life cycle here in a moment, but they spend part of their life cycle uh, underwater, and then they spend their adult portion of their life cycle above water, um, feeding on smaller organisms, um, and they are also fed upon by other organisms, both their, both their uh, juvenile and, and adult state. So they're a very important uh, link between water and land. They're, they're an important food source for larger organisms. Um, and especially when it comes to their, like I mentioned, their aquatic life cycle, um, you are only going to find um, dragonfly primarily in in clear water systems, um, systems with a lot of um, tall vegetation around around the edge of a pond or a wetland, um, and if you don't have that, then you're less likely to find dragonflies. So that's dragonfly is a good indicator um, of those systems. Uh, they're very charismatic. I'm sure all of you have seen um, a dragonfly or dragonfly. Maybe you didn't know what kind they were, but they're they're all, they're very colorful, um, especially they have different wing patterns. They're very fast flying. They have a variety of behaviors and they're a really ancient order. Um, they're, they've been around for 300 million years or so. Um, the one, um, they were, they've, they're, they've been very large. Some of the, the really ancient ones were as large as, as small hawks. Um, and they haven't, they haven't changed a lot besides their size. So they've been around, they've been able to adapt to uh, changing landscape very well. They're very widespread, they're found on every continent except for Antarctica. And finally, um, in terms of, of learning about dragonflies, there's around 60 to 70 that you might find in, in Dane County, um, in and around Madison. So there's a manageable number of species to learn. Um, and then it, Obviously, as you get to larger spatial scales, there's more and more um, around 3,500 worldwide. But um, at any given site, uh, you're probably only going to see a handful of species, which makes, makes learning them really, uh, really uh, relatively easy compared to maybe some other insect species. So just quickly to go through the life cycle, there's five main stages. Um, the first one up in the left-hand corner that's uh, encased by, by a red outline. So those are two, two dragonflies. These are common green darners. Um, and they're, they're in what's called a mating wheel. And so the male on the left, the female on the right, um, the male is fertilizing the eggs. And then um, the, next, the next photo is of the female actually laying the eggs. She'll lay eggs, um, hundreds of eggs at a time, usually on the water surface 
maybe on some floating vegetation or just under vegetation. Um, and she might lay eggs for a long time during the day, just kind of periodically poking um, her abdomen into the water, laying some eggs, moving to a different area of the wetland or the pond, laying some more eggs. Um, once those eggs hatch, they, they begin the juvenile portion of the, of the life cycle. So um, the aquatic juveniles are called naiads. Um, and um, these, are, these are fully aquatic. They, they, can, la they can stay in this form um, an entire season for multiple years, depending on the species. Um, and they are voracious predators. They, they, they eat a lot, um, a lot of food, aquatic insects, even small fish. And they'll go through several molting iterations before they're large enough to um, crawl out of the water um, from some emergent vegetation like cattails or bulrushes, which is why they're really important to have those types of plants um, coming out of the water. They'll even come out on um, artificial substrates like, like docks or other uh, posts that might be in the water. So they'll climb up and then uh, break through their exoskeleton there and then they'll just hang on for a while until their wings have dried up, um, their body has sort of um, become more rigid and they're able to fly away. Um, and this is, this is the point where they're really sort of vulnerable to predation. Um, and so this is, this is the, the part of life cycle where they, they may not make it, but once they've made it to this, this portion, then they'll fly away um, and start feeding, start looking, looking for females uh, or males to begin, begin again. So what can we all do to you know, support dragonflies and their habitat? And there's a few things that I can kind of offer here. Um, the, first, the first thing that, that we can do I'll have Susan click one forward, um, and it's actually in the in this photo. There we go. Um, and that is to basically create appropriate habitat. Um, and one of those one type of habitat are are rain gardens, especially if you're like me and you live in, in an urban area. Um, I, I don't have a lot of yard to work with, but I do have a lot of of runoff from my roof or from sidewalks um, that can be collected in these rain gardens, um, especially if, if the rain gardens that are planted with a suite of native uh, flowering species, um, it does sort of two things. One, you are creating habitat on your, on your property that maybe you have, you have some, um, some ponded water for the juveniles to um, to live in, or you have some structure there for dragonflies to, um, to forage. Um, and the other part of, uh, of, of rain gardens is that they, they keep the water from going into the street and creating, um, you know, storm water that will pick up things like fertilizers, um, leaves, sediment, and eventually that are flushed into our lakes or river systems that can create habitat that's not suitable, suitable for, for dragonflies. So you're creating habitat and also helping to sustain habitat downstream. Um, if you're lucky enough to own property along a lake or river, if you can plant and manage native emerged vegetation along that shoreline, again, we saw that part of the life cycle of dragonflies is that the, the naiads will crawl out onto vegetation to make their final molt into the adults. And so they need that kind of substrate to, to hang on to. Um, and then in terms of habitat, one last thing, that's just kind of what Susan and, and Karen were, were sharing is that planting a variety of native flowering plants that support pollinators throughout the season. Again, dragonflies will feed on other insects. Um, and so they're gonna find some insects um, out in the landscape, whether they're you know, prairies or um, wetlands or what have you. Um, and so having that floral resource for, for their food um, will really help them as well. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, joining a monitoring program or practice, practice of observing at your favorite pond or wetland, um, kind of gaining uh, an appreciation for these organisms is a great way that you can help, help support them and then share your knowledge with others. Um, and so in terms of, of programs, we actually have one at the Arboretum. It's a relatively new program. Um, we're a pretty modest size compared to some of the monarch programs as well as the bumblebee programs that are available. 
Um, but a little, a little bit about the program that, that we offer, and we can click one through. Thanks, Lucy. Um, this program um, teaches folks about dragonfly biology and ecology at a very sort of general baseline level. Um, in addition, we also, we can, we can go forward once, Susan, thank you. Um, part of the program is to help um, Arboretum staff and other scientists to collect scientific data on dragonfly abundance uh, and behavior, as well as other aspects of their life cycle at Arboretum ponds and, and wetlands. So we're not, you would not only learn about dragonflies, you would help to collect actual data that we're going to use to kind of um, take the temperature of, uh, if you will, of how the ecosystem at the Arboretum is doing in terms of dragonfly habitat. And you'll join a diverse group of volunteers that are dedicated to you know, enriching themselves to learn about something new and advancing the mission of the Arboretum. Um, so just a couple of slides here of just sharing what some recent data looks like that we've collected, actually that citizen science have collected um, at the Arboretum. So last year, citizen scientists recorded 15 species at various ponds and wetlands in the Arboretum. Um, the most, the top three in terms of common species recorded um, are from top to bottom here on the right-hand side of the, the slide, the common whitetail, the 12 spotted skimmer, and then common green drummer. Those are, those are pretty common species throughout Wisconsin. Um, and they're also common at, at the Arboretum. So it's always good to, always good to see those. Um, and then the next slide illustrates kind of where people were looking for them. Um, we've identified seven areas at the Arboretum that we are interested in folks looking at. Some are open water, some are wetlands. Um, and so each one of these spots, there are um, certain common species, um, species that maybe are, are, are less common, and it, it really did depend on the type of habitat uh, and the type of vegetation that's around the, these areas. And again, this is data that it's pretty basic data at this point, but we wouldn't have it if um, we didn't have volunteers, citizen scientists helping to look for these species. Um, and so, so the more um, the more folks that we have looking for species, often you know we'll 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 gather more data and be able to ask and at some point different questions about their life cycle, uh, and maybe even think about um, doing some sampling in the water itself for those juvenile species to see which which habitats are, are um, good for reproduction. Um, so again, if you're interested in getting involved in dragonfly monitoring or just learning more about dragonflies, we have a program at the Arboretum uh, that you can contact me to learn more about. Here's my email address. We did hold a, a webinar about a month ago, a training webinar. Uh, we'll hold one again next year, um, but I have, there's an email list that I can put you on to at least um, get in touch with other people that are that are interested in Ar Arboretum dragonflies. There are um, state resources, the Wisconsin Ordinata Survey um, is part of the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society and the DNR do statewide surveys with specific protocols. Uh, the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society has a fantastic Facebook page that I'd recommend um, if you have any interest at all learning about dragonflies. It's a great page that people submit photos. Um, it's not intimidating at all. Um, people are really, there's experts on there that are, that are more than willing to help you identify them. Um, and then at, at a national level, um, actually at a uh, North, North American level, the Ordinata, Ordinata Central site um, is a great place to see um, what, what, the, what the breadth of dragonfly diversity is at, at that level. It's a lot of different resources for you. Um, and I think that's it. So if there's time for questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, there are lots of questions here and I think we can go a little over because some of these questions kind of overlap with the stuff that Susan and I covered as well. So okay. we've got a couple questions from teachers who were interested in resources that would help them engage their students in citizen science. Um, and we can post links to a lot of programs later, but one person in particular was wondering, um, Brad Harrison is a teacher who was wondering if there are any connections to iNaturalist programs um, for, for any of these. So we could start with dragonflies or, or monarchs or bees. So he's interested in, in using iNaturalist in his classroom. 
Yeah, I don't know about about dragonflies. I I'm not sure if there is a connection with iNaturalist yet. Um, we don't. We're not using iNaturalist right now. We're using a, um, a sitside.org site um, in terms of submitting data. Um, but uh, I know that others are using uh, iNaturalist. So maybe Karen and Susan can chime in on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I can chime in a little. So iNaturalist is a is a general program. There are some kind of specific um, citizen science programs that, that kind of have a little corner of iNaturalist, but you can report anything you see on iNaturalist and it's a great way to engage students. So Brad, I would, I would really recommend using that. And when we do, when we um, compile data from many different citizen science programs and look for where monarchs are, we definitely access the iNaturalist data. Um, you don't get as much information for the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. We collect a lot more detail than you could um, put onto iNaturalist, but it certainly provides a picture of where they are. So it's a little bit like the blitz that we're doing right now for monarchs. Is you just is see a monarch and report it, and you can do that on iNaturalist. The data all get compiled. Yeah, and that's a similar situation for the bees. You can uh, take the picture, identify it on iNaturalist. Those data are not, they don't travel directly, I mean, automatically into the, um, into the websites, but they are harvested for, the, so the websites do end up gaining those and then adding them to that, for example, the map for Rusty Patch. So it would be really helpful for um, notif noting where you see something and when you see it. Uh, for phenology or for just identification. So those are really, uh, it's really a good way to do it. It's easy to use and um, the IDs continue to improve, so. Yeah, and here's an, another um, general question. Mary Ellen Kanthik asked, um, how are dragonflies, and we can, I think, talk about butterflies and bees as well, affected by village mosquito spraying? So do you wanna start with that, Brad? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm assuming that a lot of the mosquito spraying is happening in in water bodies. Um, and Susan or um, Karen, you probably know more about this, but I think generally, you know, that kind of spraying, there's there's pros and cons, winners and losers, and you know that would be one thing that I would be concerned about in terms of um, the the aquatic um, life cycle of, of dragonflies. Um, I don't know much about how that spring, how that spring actually works in the water column, how, how long it stays and it's, if it's a general spray or a mosquito specific spray, but um, so yeah, maybe, maybe Karen, if you know more about, about that specifically. Yeah, um, so definitely dragonflies and butterflies and bees would be affected by the insecticides that target the adult mosquitoes. So those are sprayed out into the environment. Um, they're often sprayed in areas where there are, are a lot of plants and those are not specific to mosquitoes. So any kind of a flying spray can, is, is killing all insects, including dragonflies and butterflies and bees. Um, the, the insecticides that they use to target larval mosquitoes, so if they're putting something directly into the water, are specific to diptera. So they would kill mosquitoes and flies, anything that just has two wings, but they, they would not kill um, dragonfly nymphs, which are, or naiads, which are in the water. Yep. So the, but the sprays out in the air will kill everything. Um, and then we'll, we'll take one more dragonfly question here and then move on to kind of general citizen science. You guys have so many good questions. Um, but this was kind of a fun one. Um, Alan Hills was lucky enough to get to go to the Boundary Waters a couple weeks ago. And he watched dragonflies snatching tiny worms that were hanging um, from trees. So he's curious about what what dragonflies eat? Do they eat mosquitoes and black flies and little tiny worms? That's their diet. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen or heard of dragonfly eating worms, but uh, I'm actually going up to the Bondi Waters in two weeks. So I'm going to look for that phenomenon. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah, dragonflies will eat a lot of different insects um, kind of based on size. I mean, they'll eat, they'll eat moths, they'll eat um, 
you know, flies. Um, they're, they're, they're very good hunters. They're fast flyers. They can, they can, they can move very quickly and uh, change direction very quickly. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, any, um, any insect that is hanging around the water, whether they're perching in vegetation, maybe flying through, um, would be game if they're the right size. And even, you know, large dragonflies will also feed on small dragonflies. Um, sometimes you'll see that as well. Yeah, really interesting things. I'll just do a quick monarch. So it's, there's a question from Micah um, about taking monarch's eggs inside. Anytime you find them in your area, you can bring them inside. So if you bring them inside right now, it, yes, it would be the generation that migrates south. Um, so now what we're going to do, I think we got, oh, there's one more about Journey North. Yep, lots of tools for classrooms um, and the Journey North program. You can find a lot of different curriculum activities. So what we're going to do now is Brad's going to talk kind of in general about getting involved with citizen science at the Arboretum. And then we might have time for a few more questions at the end. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, and I want to make sure that after this, I, I do have, have one question for uh, Susan that came in during her period. So um, this, this won't take too long, but we just want to kind of wrap up here with um, ways that you can get involved with citizen science projects at the Arboretum. Um, be, besides kind of the three that we just talked about today, we, we're doing a lot of other other projects um, and we're hosting other other projects from external or, organizations. So the first, the first sort of spot to go to is our website um, that you just saw there, the Citizen Science tab. You can learn all about the different projects and who to contact. Um, a couple examples here, we do bird monitoring. We have um, a long-term dedicated naturalist that's uh, created and has monitored um, Bluebird Trail at the Arboretum. We have a new pro a, a new program where we have bird height leaders that that welcome um, the public to come and join them on weekday mornings and weekend mornings to do bird hikes through the Arboretum. Right now, this fall, we're, we suspended that program just given the situation, but um, we hope that um, one sort of the social distancing measures are lifted a little bit, uh, we can get back to that program. But that, that's a really great one. And all the data is submitted to eBird. Um, and so it's accessible uh, by anyone worldwide. Um, a new program for us is monitoring macro fungi. So mushrooms that you might see growing in the woods um, on, on decaying logs. Um, there will be uh, training, I believe, later this year uh, to help, help with this project. Um, and it's kind of run through the Madison Mycological Society as well as North American uh, Mycoflora Project. So stay tuned for information about that one. Um, we've been monitoring phenology um, really since the beginning of the Arboretum. Um, although Leopold obviously is well known for his uh, phenological work. Um, when the visitor center was open, we, we had a, a um, phenology wheel where folks could, could come and um, report their own sightings with photos about, you know, different uh, plants blooming or birds that they found um, in the Arboretum. And again, the Phenology is really the, the kind of the study of and timing of biological events. So when certain things in nature happen, um, the first bird arrival, the first um, blooming plant, or, you know, tree, herbaceous plant. Um, and so we have, we have a program where we're trying to track these events at the Arboretum. Um, and then lastly here, I mentioned we have, we have several different projects that are run by other organizations or individuals. Uh, the, the DNR is one of the main agencies in the state that runs statewide um, citizen science programs. So these include water quality monitoring, um, the Wisconsin Frog and Toad Survey. That's a really, that's the longest um, HERP survey, running survey in the country, 35 years and, and running. Snapshot Wisconsin using um, motion cameras to detect wildlife, bat monitoring, rare plant monitoring, missed species monitoring, it goes on and on. So these are programs that you would contact the, the DNR directly to get involved with. Um, but every one of these programs or the um, uh, the UW Urban Canid Project um, is the exception. That's, that's run by a lab on campus with Dr. David Drake. Um, but all these programs um, are collecting data at the Arboretum at some point during the year. Um, so lots of opportunities to get involved at the Arboretum. 
and we look forward to hearing from, from all of you. Um, and now we have some time here at the end, and I wanted to share this question that came in uh, for you, Susan, during your, your session. Um, how do birds live alongside bumblebees? And are there some that are, I assume, um, birds that are helpful uh, to their habitat and vegetation? I'm not sure if that means birds or bumblebees, but can you explain a little bit of the interaction between native birds or uh, non-native birds and, and bumblebees? Well, there are probably some interactions, uh, predation interactions that go on. Um, and I would think about all the bee, all the native bees, there's quite a range of sizes. So there would be uh, some of the smaller bees would be um, predated on by, by birds or by other insects like robber flies and uh, other flies that mimic bumblebees can also attack bumblebees. So there's a whole world of interactions going on out there and it's just really exciting to, to um, kind of focus in on, on ones that interest you and, uh, and learn as much as you can, share with others, get other people excited about it, and we'll just um, move forward with conserving all that we can. Yeah, so um, we, we need to wrap up right now, but um, it's been really great. Um, it's been fun sharing this with you, and I hope what you take away is that there are lots of ways you can get involved with studying and helping insects. And Brad and Susan and I would be really happy um, to get any questions from you after this. So thanks so much for coming today. Thanks, everyone.